excellent. Well, um, yes, welcome to you all um, this lovely Thursday evening for this webinar. I'm Doug Brown. I'm the Chief Exec of the British Society for Immunology, and it's my absolute pleasure to be hosting this webinar today with on behalf of our collabor collaborators and wonderful partners as well in the COVAD study, in UK PIN and in Immunodeficiency UK as well. It's been a wonderful partnership that we've been able to bring together and bring you this webinar today on living with immunodeficiency, living with COVID-19. Uh, we've got hundreds of you joining us this evening, which is really, really wonderful. And it's great that there's been this interest and, and clearly um, is an important topic. And, and again, delighted to be putting this on uh, this evening for you. We've got an amazing lineup of speakers, as you will have seen, uh, giving us views from the patient perspective, but also from the clinical and the research perspective. We'll hear from those speakers. They'll each give short talks, some with slides, some with not uh, uh, using slides. But we'll be finished with the talks probably about halfway through the webinar when we'll then open up to Q&A. So plenty of time for those questions to be asked and answers given. So please do get your questions in using the Q&A function on the Zoom platform. Um, I have a trusty assistant who is sending me the questions live on WhatsApp, and uh, I will be asking our speakers as many of those questions as possible. We can't answer any uh, personal medical questions or queries, uh, hopefully for obvious reasons, but general questions or specific questions that aren't of a, of a personal medical nature, very welcome. And as I say, we'll ask as many of those as possible of our speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker this evening, um, who is Margaret Bennett. And uh, Margaret is a person living with immunodeficiency, a strong supporter and advocate alongside Immunodeficiency UK, and is here to give us her perspective on living with immunodeficiency and living with COVID. So, Margaret, that's over to you if you'd like to switch your camera on. Right, I think I have. <laughs> can you see Wonderful. me? Wonderful. I yeah, can see you. The floor is all yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, just a very little bit about me first. Um, my name is Margaret. I'm a retired teacher. I'm married with two daughters and four grandchildren, and I have CVID. So thinking back to two years ago, I don't think I really took COVID too seriously at first. I assumed it would probably be like MERS or SARS, it would happen, but it wouldn't really have much impact on us in the UK. And it's just amazing how little we understood about it two years ago and how far we've come medically in that time. But very soon it became impossible to ignore the seriousness of the situation. Then to reinforce the fact, my shielding letter arrived. And at that point, it felt almost reckless to even sit by an open window. Um, such was the, the hype about um, COVID initially. And the other impact on us uh, was the impact on us um, having chronic diseases, chronic conditions that are managed by the NHS. So that changed in a very big way to the consultant appointments that had always been face to face suddenly became on the phone, uh, which was fine with my immunology team. They knew me well after 17 years and I knew them well too. I also knew that I had access to my immunology nurses by phone or email and through them to a doctor if necessary. So I didn't feel too cut off but routine blood stopped for a while, scans went, and that was rather disconcerting when previously, obviously, they were meant to be an important part of managing our conditions. I was also asked if I wanted to go over to do subcut infusions to avoid coming to the hospital, and that is something uh, that I did do. So I was trained up um, in March 2020, and I'm still doing that now. So however bad lockdown was for me, um, it was far worse for anybody who was living alone or not close to relatives and family that they could bubble with. I was shielding with my husband and after two years, I'm still pretty much doing the same. 
uh, and we're still happily married, which is a plus as well. I understand there are about 180,000 of us with primary and secondary immune diseases, not a large number, uh, but once you add in the family members that are affected, that would take you up to about three quarters of a million. Each time rules relaxed, the situation became more difficult for us and our families. And in a way, I felt lucky I was retired uh, because I was in charge of when or if I went out. Um, and it was so much worse for other people, um, patients with children at school, children with PIDs, and those who couldn't work from home either. But two years later, I'm still effectively in this sort of time warp um, of shielding because by avoiding contact with people, I've kept myself safe and I'm finding it really hard to move on. I know it's an airborne aerosol spread disease, but I'm still avoiding so much contact with stuff. I'm having internet shopping, I'm having groceries delivered. So um, still very much separate from society. And in spite of the antiviral availability, I don't really know how effective that is against specific diseases. So that's something else, you know, I'd like to know more about. And I think the most recent freedoms have been the hardest. Omicron is more trans transmissible. Um, we've, uh, masks have gone. Um, people don't have to self-isolate. So I made myself think about why I'm still so scared of moving on. And the answer, I think, is protection. The vaccination program has opened up the country, which is wonderful. Um, but um, it, it's still uh, a different situation for us. And the protection has passed us by. And until we have access to long lasting monoclonal antibodies, we will still be left in the shadows. So I would urge you um, to write to Sajid David, write to the devolved nations health ministers, to your MP, to try and get access to monoclonals for us in the same way that so many other countries are already doing, like the USA, Australia, Canada and Israel, to name but a few. And as I understand it, we're not even in conversation with AstraZeneca about possibly buying these for us. There's a template letter, she said, um, trying to advertise the availability on Immunodeficiency UK. Um, so that would give you a basis um, to write your letters um, to MPs and the Secretary of State. Now, there are 565 people registered this evening. So if 10 of us, if, if each of us get 10 people, friends or families to write, it will definitely bolster this campaign. We're being told COVID is going away, but there were 67,000 cases yesterday, 45% more than March the 1st, probably because people are um, mixing so much more freely. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing lots of information from the other speakers. And so I will get off my soapbox now and hand you back to Doug. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Margaret, for sharing your story and such a, an inspirational call to action as well. So thank you very much for your words. Margaret, we will have you back when we get back to Q&A. Um, just a reminder, please do get those questions in. We want to ask lots of questions of our speakers and we can't answer questions around individual healthcare situations. So please uh, avoid submitting those questions, um, but bring other questions to us that we will ask of the all the speakers later on. So moving on to our next speaker, um, we've got a run of three speakers who will introduce each other, but the first speaker who I will introduce is Samisha Savage, who is Associate Clinical uh, uh, Professor at the University of Leeds and is the chair of UK PIN as well, one of the partners in delivering this uh, webinar this evening. And I believe, Samisha, you will be talking to the risks that have, uh, have, have been out there with the different waves of COVID and really setting the scene from a clinical and research perspective. Um, Samisha, I will hand over to you and I will share my screen so we can click through the slides. Just tell me when to uh, click on to the next one. Okay, thank you, Doug. Thanks for the introduction. 
Uh, just to say, I'm also a, a practicing consultant immunologist based at St. James's Hospital in Leeds. Uh, and for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with what UK PIN is, this is a professional organization which uh, includes uh, clinicians, nurses, allied professionals, academics, everybody really who is interested in understanding better primary immune deficiencies and advancing care of uh, individuals with, this, uh, with these conditions. Now, what I'm going to try and uh, tell you about over the next five minutes is really what UK PIN give you a snapshot of some of the activities that UK PIN did during the COVID pandemic to try and help really my <clears throat> with our uh, community, our patients, and uh, advocate really for some of the treatments and, and, and efforts that we all collectively have been trying to do. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, this now feels like a very distant past, but uh, as Margaret said, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when it all started, all of us knew very little about what we were about to face. And uh, there were, we were getting sporadic reports from China about this new uh, infection. There was some information about how it's affecting otherwise healthy individuals, but there was very little really to know or, or, or learn about how this is really affecting individuals with weakened immune system. And uh, we ourselves were also, you know, trying to prepare for something that, for which, about which we know very little. Uh, next slide, please, Doug. And um, at the time, obviously, as the, our, uh, uh, the outbreak hit the UK shows, the government put out this advice, which was pragmatic at the time about shielding and clearly uh, encompassed many different groups of patients uh, uh, who needed to shield. As Margaret again mentioned, this sounded quite draconian to begin with because you know you had to be quite uh, uh, restrictive in, you, in, in what you were able to do. So we felt uh, that probably we could try and improve on this as a, a group and you know, try and provide a bit more granular advice to help people. Because although shielding is important, it can be quite restrictive. And as we all know, although primary immune deficiency is, it's an umbrella diagnosis. And I'm, I'm under that umbrella, there are all sorts of types of conditions, some which are relatively mild, and for which maybe there is very little need to shield. And really, this advice needed to be taken extremely uh, seriously. Uh, as the way things work in NHS, for example, patients with hereditary angioedema were put into this umbrella under deficiencies and were originally told they needed to shield. So we felt as a group of professionals and the ones that uh, we had some understanding about the immune system and the, we could maybe provide a bit more granular and more helpful advice to individuals that were in this uh, category. So this is what we did at the beginning of March and divided um, different uh, disease categories in terms of need for extreme shielding and somewhere where this could be relaxed. But this advice at the time, I must stress, was not based on any direct experience or any direct knowledge of what the COVID-19 is like in patients with primary immune deficiency. Next slide, Doug, please. And this is the reason why uh, we collectively as, uh, as uh, in the UK felt it was important to try and collect information about what happens to individuals with immune deficiency, what outcomes we are likely to see, and whether the advice we gave was appropriate, whether that needs to be. Before we were, uh, had full uh, information on our uh, situation in the UK, there was another international study which did kind of similar thing. They've uh, published experienced across several different countries uh, showing uh, what the outcomes were supposed to be in individuals with immune deficiency. This was an international study. The data was published shortly before we were going to publish our data from the UK. And that original publication suggested that although patients at more risk, that risk wasn't overly as 
necessarily high as uh, some people have worried. Uh, our experience in the UK was different. Uh, from the first 100 cases that we collected, uh, it was very clear at that time that if you were admitted to the hospital with immune deficiency, your outcome was uh, worse than somebody who uh, of the same age and same risk factors uh, 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 who was otherwise told to, to be healthy was admitted with COVID-19. So the initial uh, um, information we were getting vindicated some of the strong advice we uh, issued originally about some of our most vulnerable patients. Um, the next slide, Doug. Clearly, uh, this was a relatively limited exercise and despite our efforts, you know, we couldn't really guarantee that we were able to collect all the cases uh, obviously uh, were seen in the UK and there was uh, criticism that the maybe work we did was uh, skewed towards people uh, and maybe there was a reporting bias and maybe this is why in the UK worse outcomes than we were than in other countries. Uh, just to say that uh, it, our report included only adults, where the reports, for example, from other places also included children with immune deficiency. And we have subsequently learned that children generally speaking with or without immune deficiency did significantly better than adults. So it is really the age, like in all, uh, for all other groups that was the main risk factor. So when we conducted, continued to collect the data and we had then subsequently uh, altogether 310 cases, and this is the work that has just been published in uh, BSI, Journal of Clinical Experimental Immunology. What we were able to show there is that, unfortunately, individuals who with immune deficiency who died tended to be older, which is the same risk factor that we've seen really with otherwise healthy population, although the overall age was less than a, a generally healthy population. And also we were beginning to get some clues about what markers of the immune system may alert us to who is at more risk. So for example, reduced lymphocyte count, which is again something that uh, uh, we thought likely to be important. Um, next slide, please. We have continued to obviously collect the data throughout all of this again with all the colleagues across different uh, immunology centers in the UK and, and uh, from September to now, and again, particularly with help of uh, COVID study, which uh, thank all of you who have volunteered to take part in this, we were able to get more uh, detailed data about anybody who then had infection. And uh, we now have some preliminary results, uh, which we have just analyzed, which suggests that really outcomes have beginning to improve significantly uh, in the latest wave, if you like, of infection, particularly with Omicron. Now, it's not entirely clear whether that is a result of the vaccination that was successful in the UK, whether that was due to more treatment options that uh, Professor Richter will be talking about in her talk uh, that we now currently have, or whether this is consequence also of the milder variant of the virus that is currently circulating. Most likely it is probably a combination of all of these things that we are seeing uh, uh, improved outcomes uh, uh, in, in, in our patient population in the latest uh, wave of infection. The next slide, Doug. So I'll finish here. Obviously, uh, I, there's a lot of questions that have come through and I've seen some of them have already asked, particularly about the studies that we did and we'll try and answer those. For the time being, I would just like to thank all the patients who have uh, contributed to, uh, to uh, the data to the studies, which was really valuable for us to be able to understand the impact and all the colleagues across the UK centers who have worked tirelessly during the pandemic to really collect that data. So I'll finish here, and then I will now introduce uh, Professor Siobhan Burns, who uh, is one of the chief investigators together with Alex Victor of COVID study, who will, over the next five minutes or so, tell us about 
some of the uh, published results and some of the preliminary results from this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sinissa. Um, so it's my pleasure to, um, to be able to present to you this evening some of the results of the COVAD study. And I'm conscious that many uh, on this call will uh, be participants in this study. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So this is a study that's been led out of Birmingham and UCL, but has involved uh, many centers around the country. Next slide, please. And you can see uh, on my little map here, different centers that have been involved, so about 10 or so. Um, and the COVAS study was set up so that we could try to understand the immune response in patients with immune deficiency, either primary or secondary immune deficiency, who had antibody deficiency where they were either had an IgG level less than four and would uh, an, on antibiotic prophylaxis with uh, infections or were receiving immunoglobulin therapy. So the vast majority of people who are in this study are, are patients on immunoglobulin therapy and everybody in the study is somebody who has antibody deficiency. Next, please. Thank you. Um, and this is just a diagram showing what the study actually did. So for, for those of you who entered the study, you'll know this. We took baseline blood samples and a PCR swab to look for COVID. And then we took additional samples after the second dose of vaccine, which was the second dose of the primary course, and additional samples after the third dose of vaccine. Um, and then we continue to monitor people and we continue to look at whether um, people develop COVID and also take samples over time to look at the antibody and T cell responses to vaccination and wild type infection. Next, please. And overall, the study has recruited uh, since March 2021, so in the past year, over 500 participants and is uh, still, I think, the biggest study of its kind uh, in the world for patients with antibody deficiency. Next slide, please. So I just want to show you um, a little bit of data from the study. And this, what I'm showing you this evening are the figures that um, are our most recent and up-to-date data for a manuscript that is not yet uh, published. Um, and this diagram here looks a bit busy, but if effectively what we're showing here is antibody responses uh, in patients after vaccination. And we've divided the data into each dot is an individual. Um, red, red dots are individuals who received AstraZeneca as their uh, first primary course of vaccine, so vaccine one and two. The blue dots are, are people who received Pfizer as their uh, first two vaccines. And what you can see is that one month after the, um, the, the second vaccination, which is the 1M vaccine, uh, yeah, part of the, of the diagram just on the left-hand side, that uh, individuals who had had Pfizer um, had a higher antibody response than individuals who had AstraZeneca. Um, and you, what you can also see is that actually quite a lot of patients with antibody made detectable responses, which is any dot that, that lies above that little gray zone at the bottom. Um, and maybe this was a little bit surprising, um, but that was what we found. And you can see that as we followed antibody levels to the vaccine over six months, that the antibody levels waned, just like has been seen in the in healthy control populations. Um, and you can also see that in the one month post column, uh, the, which is after the first after the third vaccine, so one month after the third vaccine, there's a big jump up in the amount of antibodies that individuals make, uh, wh whether they've had AstraZeneca or Pfizer for their primary course. So by the time people uh, with antibody deficiency have had a third vaccination, a significant proportion have made antibodies. It doesn't matter whether it was AstraZeneca or Pfizer for the uh, initial course. And then we can see as we started to follow people after the third dose of vaccine, that again, we, we see levels starting to wane uh, at two and three months after uh, the, the third primary dose. Next, please. And what I'm showing here in these little gray bars are the levels that um, of antibodies that have been made by participants in healthy control studies. So those were what we would say would be the healthy control range or the average amount of antibody that um, 
somebody without an immune deficiency might make, might make. So you can see immediately that um, while patients with antibody deficiency do make antibodies to uh, the COVID vaccination, at least a, a significant proportion, this is in general less than the amount of antibody seen in participants who uh, are healthy controls and do not have antibody deficiency. Next, please. Um, and this uh, graph on the right-hand side of your screen now just summarizes the data showing uh, everybody who we've analyzed, which is about 200 in this particular data I'm showing you here, um, where you can see that with all the, everybody with antibody deficiency after the second dose of vaccine uh, have got an average uh, immunoglobulin level of around two. And we've got groups of people who've made responses to the vaccine and groups who have not. Um, and then you can see after just a month before the third dose that the antibody levels have waned. And then if we check the antibody levels again after the third dose, there's a significant jump up again, which is significantly higher than uh, before the uh, third dose. Next, please. And overall, the we found that 56% of participants in our study made some detectable level of antibody to the COVID vaccines after the second dose. Um, but if we measured after the third dose, this had risen to about 76%. And that indicates that some individuals who had not made a detectable antibody level after two doses were still able to make a detectable antibody level after three. Next slide, please. Um, and we've, we've heard a lot in the newspapers about antibody and T-cell responses to vaccines. And this is the T-cell information that we have. And the T-cell, um, T-cell, uh, the, the ways to measure T-cells in the laboratory are probably slightly more difficult than the ways to measure antibodies. Um, but the information that we have is shown here. And again, each individual is shown as a little square. Um, and individuals who have had previous wild type COVID infection are shown in red, and those who have, who have not had COVID infection are shown in blue. And what you can see here is that the uh, number, the proportion of people who have got a detectable T cell response to uh, the, the SARS CoV 2 uh, virus are much higher in the people who've had prior infection compared to those who have not had prior infection. And this is uh, for all patients that we've measured with antibody deficiency. And there doesn't seem to be such a big influence over time or boosting on the T-cell response. T-cell response, you can see, it seems to be a little bit more constant over time between after the second dose, before the third dose, and after the third dose. Um, but what we can say is that a proportion of patients do make a T-cell response, and that this is higher in uh, antibody deficient patients who've had wild type infection. Next, please. So overall, after the second dose, if we just look at everybody together, both those with infection and those without infection, about 48% of participants um, had made a T cell response after the second dose of vaccine, whereas about 60% had made a dose after the third, um, had made a, made a T cell response after the third dose of vaccine. Next, please. Um, and this, graph here just shows that T cell responses were seen both after AstraZeneca and Pfizer primary courses. And there's a trend towards the T cell response being higher in individuals who have had AstraZeneca. Um, but I think at the moment, we don't really know whether that actually in practice means anything. Next slide, please. So the take home messages that I want to present to you today are that a significant proportion of individuals with antibody deficiency make a detectable antibody and T cell response to COVID vaccination. Although this is at a lower level than, than we see in individuals who do not have immune deficiency. Um, I think it's important to uh, to, to state that we don't know what level of antibody or T cell response is required for protection against COVID. And I imagine we'll come back to this again in the questions and answers. But uh, th there's no doubt that a third dose of vaccine significantly increases antibody responses, including in individuals with antibody deficiency. Next slide, please. And this is just an acknowledgement slide to acknowledge many of the people who have been involved in this study. This wouldn't have happened without uh, the, the collaboration of uh, participants who have agreed to be part of this, and um, the collaboration of our, of our clinical colleagues around the country, and then UKRI and Oxford Immunitech who, uh, who funded the project. And we're thankful to all of them. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over now to Alex. Um, so, Alex, I think away you go.
Thank you very much, Siobhan, and uh, lovely to be here this evening. Um, so today I just want to finish up with a little bit about COVID treatments and what is currently available and what we're hoping is going to become available um, over the next months. Next slide, please, Doug. Thank you. Well, I thought it would be quite helpful to just look to see how extraordinarily far we've come. Um, I remember with horror that spring of 2020, and honestly, we had um, oxygen uh, and, and a prayer as our treatment options in patients. And then there was this rapid change with the um, recovery trial, which discovered the benefit of this steroid called dexamethasone. And that dramatically improved um, how sick patients became, whether they needed to go to ITU and their, their hospital stay. And in addition to this, we had a intravenous antiviral drug called remdesivir. Um, at the same kind of time, we started to get the first of the monoclonal antibodies coming into these big national trials like recovery. Um, and um, Regenkov was, was one of them. And then the other IV treatment option for very acutely unwell people were these really strong targeted anti-inflammatories against some very specific um, um, inflammatory control proteins called cytokines and tocilizumab was one and there's another one now targeting a different pathway called baricitinib. And the outcome from these medicines uh, in inpatient care is that patients in spring 2022, if they are admitted to hospital with COVID, are doing so much better than spring 2020. So without a doubt, these treatments are modulating the disease course and improving survival. So a fantastically good news story. But actually some of the hints that we had was all of these treatments work better if you could start them earlier. And what we were finding certainly in the, the first couple of waves is people would catch COVID, but it was only on days five to 10 that they would become unwell enough to be admitted to hospital. And so we were finding that some of these treatments really weren't that effect, as effective at these later stages. And so in um, late 2021 with the Delta wave and then into Omicron, we set up um, outpatient treatment areas and I'll come on to those. And this was giving either a dose of a monoclonal antibody, mostly a monoclonal antibody called citrovimab, um, but also um, oral antivirals. Now, part of this was being done through routine clinical practice, but there were also studies that were monitoring this. Now, we're not quite there yet, but we want to get to that point of preventative care, especially for the patients on this call, where we know responses to vaccination aren't as good as Siobhan's already shown you. And we know that prophylaxis with antibodies is effective for so many of the, 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 the pathogens that, that, that you are exposed to. And we know that it reduces the risk of infections in many people. So the government is looking at monoclonal antibodies. I tried to get an update from the, the group that's doing this yesterday to be up to date. And that there are a number of issues around the monoclonal antibodies that are still being worked out. I'm sure you realize that um, immunity is different to the different um, variants. And there is the people are working out at the moment because we now we've got Omicron, but we're seeing a variation of the Omicron called BA2 coming, and there might even be another variant coming. And so similar to how we know that the first monoclonal antibody really wasn't much use for Omicron. 
we want to make sure that, or the government wants to make sure that the monoclonal antibody that potentially could be used in prophylaxis is going to be useful and effective going forward. I think the other thing to mention on monoclonals is dosing. Now, the doses that have been used in most trials have not necessarily been the dose, you know, the, the, there's a lot of um, data now from inpatient use of monoclonals. And there is also some outpatient use. But in terms of a trial of how this, these monoclonal antibodies work in patients with antibody deficiency and wider immune deficiencies, is still not known. And in the UK, there are going to be studies opening. And again, that is contributing to, to the delay because the government's saying, well, you know, which of these should we order? What dose should be given? And, and, and where do we, you know, how do we get this underway? Now, the, um, what we do know, though, is that we're starting to get, well, we are getting small amounts of um, natural antibodies in our immunoglobulin products. So if we test them in the laboratory, we can test that, you know, that there is some positivity. As Siobhan and Zanisha have alluded to, though, we don't know how much is enough. Now, the government has done some really big studies. There's something called PAPATI, which has been looking at antibodies in everybody that tests positive in the UK population as early as possible to see if we can try and define what a protective level of antibody is, because that would hugely help us know how much antibody we need to give you to protect you. But actually, after over two years now of exploring this number of research groups, number of governments, and you know, it's been a real global effort, it is quite clear to me that we're not finding a single protective level. And this to me depend, it, it, it all depend, it's too variable per individual. It's too variable um, as to how competent that person's immune system is. And it's too variable according to the variant. So I think what we're going to have to do is take the pragmatic view as we do with most immunoglobulin that having some antibodies in the immunoglobulin is better than having none. And, you know, we don't know whether we have protective antibodies against most common pathogens, such as, you know, flu or, um, you know, pneumococcus or any of other those um, infections which you're exposed to. We don't measure that in immunoglobulin. We just take the pragmatic view that we know there is some antibody in there and having some is going to help your immune system, if not protect you from getting the infection altogether, hopefully making it a much, much milder infection. We know that immunoglobulin replacement doesn't cure all our antibody deficiency patients of all infections. We know that you get breakthrough infections on immunoglobulin. Um, so we just we need to hope that there's going to be enough in there to produce long term protection. But we are also hoping that we can get this much higher dose, um, which would be in a treatment monoclonal antibody. Now, with the monoclonal antibodies, um, it has already been mentioned about Evershield, but there are other products coming on the market. Um, there's citrovimab. So we, 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 we are likely to have hopefully more than one monoclonal antibody. And I think that's really important because which one you have may be important for which variant is prominent at the time. Next slide, please. So that is the kind of timeline. Um, one of the questions that I know policymakers ask of our academic community and the studies that are being run is, you know, do these patients improve outcomes in immune deficiency patients? Um, you know, this is both in terms of survival, but also in terms of viral persistence. We know a number of patients with immune deficiency really struggle to clear the virus. And we've had people positive for months and months and months. 
And so most of the evidence that we have for antivirals and monoclonal antibodies comes from sub-analysis of some of the big studies like recovery. And so what we have to kind of fight and lobby for is that actually we, we need our own studies in our immune deficiency patients to really understand the benefit because we believe that these medicines are going to be of more benefit to you than to someone with a healthy immune system. There, are, there is an evidence base and we've been doing things like um, case series, um, trying to work with all our co colleagues, consultant colleagues in the UK and our professional bodies to try and understand outcomes, not as a, a, as a, um, a trial, but as an observational study. And um, David Lowe led um, one paper which has just come out showing that both the monoclonals and the antivirals do seem to have a real impact on the treatment of um, chronic or relapsing COVID in our immune deficiency patients. And a number of other studies have shown that there is quite, a, um, there is benefit in our subgroup of patients where we feel there is the most benefit. Next slide, please. Um Alex, I'm very sorry. I'm going to have to draw this to a close at this point. Otherwise, we will run out of time for questions. I could listen to you all for hours on end. Um, but perhaps the, the other areas that you are going to pick up on, we've had a lot of questions coming in. I'll come to you with lots of questions and you can answer those as well. So I'm sorry to have to, to just draw that to a close there. But if... Um, the other speakers could join us. I will stop sharing my screen and then we can open it up to uh, 15 minutes or so of Q&A with um, our speakers. But huge thank you to you all. Wonderful insights from the patient clinical and research perspective, which um, has been very valuable and lots of support and love coming in from the uh, Q&A and chat function for you all. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wonder, um, Sunisha, and then Margaret, I'll come to you for this, if we could start um, with a, a question around um, that's come in from a few people, actually, about how uh, people living with immunodeficiency can explain their anxieties around going into a world with COVID to family members and friends that may not understand. Um, and Sunisha, have you got any advice or tips on that? And then Margaret will come to you to see if you've experienced this yourself and whether you have some advice too. <clears throat> Thanks, Doug. That's, uh, <clears throat> it is really an important issue, particularly now that seemingly the rest of the world <laughs> is moving on and uh, we are needing to understand really how to best advise and protect our patients who have weakened immune system and the COVID hasn't disappeared as we have seen from the latest figures, the numbers are up again. I mean, you know, it's one of those things trying to really engage with family members to understand the uh, uh, reasons to why somebody needs that protection and encouraging them to potentially even come to the clinics uh, if they're coming for face to face to discuss uh, what are the best options for them and for their family in, in terms of encouraging everybody else to get vaccinated and encouraging everybody else to be cautious. Mm. Uh, and those are really the only things that we can control at the moment. Mm. No, absolutely. Thank you, Sunisha. And it, you know, we've definitely entered a new era, even though the pandemic is not over. And Margaret, have you experienced this where you have maybe family members, friends that just find it very difficult to understand, you know, you explaining why you have to be careful? Uh, I think I've just been really lucky because people do seem to get it and um, they are protective of me. Um, so I, I know that isn't the case with everybody. Um, and I think it's trying to, to find things perhaps, you know, on the charity website that you could show to relatives to explain why we are more at risk than other people, if they don't just, you know, take it at face value in terms of what you're telling them um, and, and hope that maybe helps. That's brilliant. Some great advice there. And I'm sure many of our viewers will 
be very grateful for that. So thank you both. Um, lots of questions, as you can imagine, coming in about vaccines. So Siobhan, um, just come to you and you mentioned in your talk um, the data that you've collected within COVAD around the first, second, third dose. But there are quite a lot of questions coming in about, well, what difference will a fourth dose make? And is there going to be a fifth, sixth, seventh? Is this going to be something yeah. that we have to have for many, many years going into the future? Maybe. Um, so I think what we can say, I'm going to be fairly brief because I'm conscious there's loads of questions, but um, there are some studies being done now about the efficacy of fourth dose, fourth doses, not particularly in immunodeficient um, groups of patients, but in healthy individuals. And again, the it looks like um, antibodies wane after third dose, as I've shown. Uh, fourth dose gives a, a rise in antibodies again. There's some question about whether that um, you get more than after the third dose, after a fourth dose, but at least you do get a boost again in your immunity. The studies are really um, need to be done to look at how effective that is in protecting COVID, but the early studies look like uh, there is some impact on protecting um, a, a mild COVID and there is an impact uh, on protecting against severe COVID. So it's looking like fourth doses are have got some benefit, but as I said, that really needs to be studied in different groups of patients. Um, mm. the fifth dose, sixth dose, I don't know. I think it's possible. I mean, I think the research is only rolling one, we're only one step behind. So, uh, you know, we're now studying fourth dose, then it's going to be what about fifth dose? Um, so I think, I think it's possible, that's my personal view, that we could be here t with annual or so COVID vaccination. Okay, now that's, that's, that's really interesting. You say the research is keeping up as quickly as it can, really, isn't it? And just to pick up on some other things that you mentioned in your talk, and they've come through. So I'm looking here because this is where the questions are coming through. They're coming through on the questions thick and fast. Is that, of course, and you've said, Siobhan, that we don't know what level of antibody or T cell response is needed to provide protection. Um, but some questions coming in about, you know, what can individuals do to be able to understand what vaccine response they're getting and what their own personal risk might yeah. be? Is there a way that they can find that out and interpret that data? Yeah, so I think I think it's difficult. I mean, in, in all honesty, we are not using vaccine, we are not using antibody levels to say to people whether or not we think they're more or less risk because we just don't really know. So I think that uh, there were a number of questions that were came in before the seminar asking about things like, should you be asking to get your antibodies checked? Should you get private tests to do it? My, my advice would be to be cautious and not to spend a lot of money doing it because we, um, we still don't really know. We're not using that information for individual patients in clinical practice. We are still saying to people, be careful about um, reducing exposure as much as possible. And Alex had a very nice slide about what to, how we can, we can minimize risk. And that is still, I think, our, um, we're saying get vaccinated, definitely. Probably don't worry too much about what your response is. Um, continue to do the basics in terms of protection. And then there's definitely good news with the new drugs that are coming, coming uh, online. That's fantastic. Thank you, Siobhan. And um, some good advice, some caution around private providers and the, the charges that, that might be associated with those tests. Yeah. And it's also important. You don't always get a result back that actually puts your result in any context with what the healthy control would perform on that test. You get a, a, a result back that says that you have got a detectable antibody level, but that may be very low or it may be in the normal range, but you don't know that. Mm. Um, so I think it is really it's it's a can of worms yeah and and coming to you margaret on this that that can of worms how has that felt for you and and others that that you you're you're linked in with uh, in your community well i think it is hard because um you know if, even if you knew um a number um you you wouldn't know whether that was functional whether it would actually work to protect you um, as I understand it, uh, you know, you, you can just find find a number, but that may give you false reassurance. Um, so I, I'm really not, I certainly wouldn't go down that route. Mm. So a frustration that that we want a number, but yeah, yeah. actually it's, it's not there and, uh, and actually could be more damaging than yeah. the helpful. 
Mm. Okay, no, really, really fascinating. Um, Alex, we'll come to you now because there's been a lot of questions, as you can imagine, around uh, monoclonal antibody prophylactic treatment. I mean, could you, in a nutshell, describe, because some people are asking, you know, what are monoclonal antibodies? How do they work? Could you just give us a very quick explanation of what they are and what they do? Okay, so, so when we have an infection, one of the things our immune system does is produces an antibody. And what that antibody does is it helps clear the infection on that occasion, but it also it is produced by a cell that is long lived. So it gives us immune memory. And that, that, that the antibodies are very useful, not just for clearing that response, but recognizing that infection. If your body becomes you know, infected on a second occasion. So that antibody is really important to really kickstart the immune system as soon as an infection hits the body. So a monoclonal antibody is when we've created one. And what we've done is we've created an antibody just against a, the, what we think is the most important target of the virus. And I think we've all heard about spike proteins now, and some people may have heard of the RBD or the you know, binding domain. And um, it is is these bits which antibodies recognize. And so the monoclonals will be against one of those. Now, the difference is in natural immunity, um, you know, you will have a peak of antibodies and then they'll drop down again. As Siobhan's shown very nicely. Um, But with monoclonal antibodies, it's a way of keeping levels topped up all the time. And in terms of what's happening, I mean, I mentioned the monoclonals um, and and where we are at the moment. We don't have them available to us prophylactically, but we do have them available to us if you do get COVID. So, you know, thinking about trying to open up and trying to, um, you know, protect um, our patients, it, you know, it is really about prevention of infection as far as possible but we know that that is you can only de-risk that and actually a lot of our patients are dealing with this day to day anyway because it covid's not the only infection that's dangerous to them you know we, we have so many infections which we're all exposed to which our patients are vulnerable to so actually many of our patients are, are complete experts in preventing infection prior to covid you know, so they do naturally avoid busy trains in rush hour. They do, you know, mask wearing, I think, has become more acceptable now. You know, um, people try and avoid unwell children or, you know, unwell adults. And they ask family members to stay away if they're unwell. So all of these are de-risking in mm-hmm. COVID. And then that early recognition, so if you're continuing to monitor yourself, there is this possibility to go to these COVID medicine delivery units so the CMDUs, and you should be contacted automatically if you are on the list, but lots of our patients aren't on the list. And so if you haven't heard within 24 hours of a positive test, you should either contact your GP or 111 or your hospital team, and they will refer you into the CMDU and they will review your um, application for either antivirals or a monoclonal antibody treatment. That's great. No, some some great advice and reminders for people there um, on what the options are available. Though, Alex, just to stick with you, and maybe Sanisha, you want to come in at this point as well. Picking up on Margaret's challenge earlier and that call to action around monoclonal antibodies used as a prophylactic where the UK um, appears to be behind other countries. Have you got any words on why that that is the case and what is happening to potentially try and change that? Alex, let's come to you and then to you, Sanisha. Well, I mentioned some of the challenges and, and, you know, the reasons why there is this delay. We may or may not think that delay is acceptable, but that is the reasons they're, they're, they're worrying, I guess, about, you know, whether it actually works or not, what dose we should be giving. And, it, you know, 
I think a number of us feel it's a little bit like, you know, Nero watching Rome while it burns. You know what I mean? It, 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 it doesn't feel fair. Um, and so there is a lot of lobbying. Um, Immune Deficiency UK is lobbying. UK PIN is lobbying. I know the BSI has done some work. Um, so we're trying to, 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 to influence that. Um, but anything anyone can do to support that um, would be fantastic. Mm. That's great, Alex. Thank you. And and Sunisha, any any response to Margaret on the, the patients in the UK have been left in the shadows? Anything specific from the lobbying activity that you've been leading through UK PIN? I just to say, I mean, I think, you know, as always, some things have been done great by the government and we were being there at the front, you know, the vaccination program, for example, that's important to highlight. I don't think we can just keep kicking them. It's not an easy task to try and there's a whole host of new treatments coming through and it's not that easy to necessarily evaluate those and the, at the pace that is needed and with the evidence that's necessary. You know, we also don't wanna be doing people any harm. And uh, this is an important, I think, point to make. And although we are all keen to get the best treatments available as fast as possible way, mindful of potential harm and that these things do need to be assessed properly. And I think also it's important to say the UK was one of the leading countries in terms of assessing all different treatments that uh, Alex mentioned previously. I think we were leading the way to the recovery trial really to provide the evidence what works and what doesn't. And you can say that in many places, people were given all sorts of stuff which later on proved not to be of any use or actually was potentially harmful. So although we are all very keen to get the best treatments and the most effective therapies for our patients, you know, it doesn't always work all that straightforwardly. There are delays, but I think uh, there is a lot of lobbying behind the scene that we are trying to get this as, as, as available as soon as these the, these are uh, in the UK. So sometimes in some place, in some ways, we, we have been ahead of the game uh, against many other countries internationally. Sometimes we are a little bit behind. I think overall, you know, I think we uh, as a country have done extremely well. I think we should be proud of that uh, generally. And in particular, all people who took part in the trials, you know, without that, it would have, we wouldn't have been anywhere near here. Definitely. And um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but I want to get squeeze a couple more questions in from people. So many questions coming in, which is fantastic. So question for you, Sunisha, then Siobhan, and then Margaret, I'm going to come to you for some final reflections. So you are holding the mic as final <laughs> word on this webinar. So Sunisha, questions come in um, about long COVID and are patients with immune deficiency at higher risk of developing long COVID compared to non-patients? Uh, very briefly, we don't know. I mean, we actually don't know, know very little about long COVID. I mean, it's, as you know, this is currently being heavily studied and we are beginning to understand a bit more about what goes on in uh, long COVID. I don't think from any anecdotal evidence that I have or information that I have, he heard about it, patients with primary immune deficiency are any greater risk of developing long COVID than others. But we, again, we need to collect the data. So, so no cause for concern at the moment, but we need that data to, to confirm that. Thank you, Sunisha. And Siobhan, um, we, we mentioned uh, uh, research and taking part in research, and of course, you're playing a leading role in the COVID study. Questions coming in about, well, you know, how can patients get involved in research? Where do they find out where these studies are and, and get um, potentially recruited onto them? That is a question I'm actually going to hand to Alex, because Alex has probably got his probably best place to, um, to answer that. Fantastic. Alex, over to you. Um, so the, the two ways, I think the key thing to do is check with your clinical team what studies are open at your centre. Um, but there are also um, national studies. So there's the panoramic study, which is um, an online um, study run through Oxford where you get access to oral um, treatments. There's the PREVENT study and the PROTECT V study, which hopefully is opening this month, um, which is doing the prophylactic antibiotic, uh, antibiotics, prophylactic monoclonals. And, um, and um, that should be opening in at least 10 centers, both of those studies in the UK. But again, check with your team. 
but we're also going to be doing, I saw an answer in the chat, some um, observational studies, because of course, people are being given monoclonals in hospital, in the CMDUs, but who's collating that information? It's got to be done. We've tried to do it in an ad hoc way, but actually we need proper studies. So again, um, David Lowe in London has got the lunar study up and running to try and look to see how that's gonna work. And also the recovery study has an arm as well. Um, we're going to continue with our cohort monitoring with COVAD. Um, this is funded until July this year, and we will be trying to look for more funding to try and continue our cohort um, to be able to keep you all up to date with what we know. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. That's that's really, really helpful. And so, Margaret, yeah. let's come... Oh, Siobhan, did you have something to add? I, I was just going to make a, a kind of final reflection, if that's all right, because I saw a couple, there have been a, just a couple of things I've noticed coming up in the chat, and I, one of them was we need hope. And um, I, I guess one of the things that is really important for people to hear from tonight is that things are very different for patients with immune deficiency now compared to at the start of the pandemic. There are... Uh, there's no doubt that the what we're seeing clinically in terms of the severity of COVID in our patients is an order of magnitude less than at the beginning of the pandemic. And the data that we've shown you tonight about outcomes is will be superseded by another publication, which we hope is going to come out soon, looking at the patients really that have all got COVID, say, since December. And um, I mean, I can tell you that at the Royal Free, we've had about 80 patients who have had COVID since December and the outcomes have just been so much better for that group of patients than at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think that's probably a combination of Omicron might be less, probably is less, uh, less, less severe. People are vaccinated and we don't know exactly what, how protective that is in our patient groups, but we think that there is likely to be some benefit from that. The drugs are much better. People are getting treated quickly. The CMDUs are available. So I think there is a lot of hope. And um, there's a lot, of course, there's a lot of studies, et cetera, and research that we need to do going forward. And there is still lobbying we need to do. But the situation compared to a year ago is, is mm. like night and day, I think. Well, that's fantastic. And th those reflections incredibly helpful, Siobhan. And, and the UK has definitely been uh, a leading light uh, across the world in getting these studies up and running and identifying the treatments and, and of course, getting the vaccines um, into people's arms as well. So um, thank you, Siobhan, really helpful reflection. So Margaret, now it's time for you to have the final word. Oh, wow, thank you, <laughs> I think. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say how important this has been to so many people, the fact that you have had so many more people sign up to this than you've ever had before, you know, 560 people, and it will be available online later, so a lot more people will be able to see it too. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for uh, giving us some hope towards the end there. Um, and I just think we need another one, only next time we need an hour and a half of questions. <laughs> but thank you for uh, letting me represent the patient voice on the BSI this evening. It's our pleasure. And Margaret, you've done half of my job to close the webinar for me, which makes it very easy. But uh, thank you, Margaret, but thank you to all of the other speakers as well. You've been amazing. I completely agree with the timing, Margaret. We could do this for several hours i'm sure but we're trying to keep it short and snappy but i think that it does go to show there's appetite mm -hmm. for us to be doing this again yeah. and probably quite soon yeah. as well so thank you very much speakers and thank you everyone for joining you know we've got hundreds joining um as margaret said we've got a recording that um has been made and that will be available on the website for free access next week on the british society for immunology website so please do click on that access that, share that with your friends and family and those that couldn't make it this evening for the live webinar. Um, big thank you to uh, our partners as well, the COVAD study, UK PIN and Immunodeficiency UK. It's been a real pleasure working with all of you and pulling this together and look forward to doing it again at some point in the very near future. Um, and don't forget, there's lots of information on all of those websites, the British Society for Immunology, UK PIN, Immunodeficiency uh, UK, lots of information on, on the, the pandemic, on COVID, on living with immunodeficiency. So please do visit those websites um, and get in touch. If there's any gap in that information, let us know and we will try our best to fill it. The other point just to note, and I realise we're a few minutes over and apologies for that, but um, a lot of the issues and the questions that have come up tonight are 
about things that we could be doing even more of, do better, where where are those gaps? And what we've done is we've, we've collated all of those questions and at the British Society for Immunology, continuing to work with UKPIN and Immunodeficiency UK, we will continue to lobby and be advocates for people living with immunodeficiency across treatments, across prophylactic treatments and vaccination um, and anything to do with living with immunodeficiency. So we are taking all of your questions if there are repeated themes coming up in that that we're not currently advocating for, then we will take that into our discussions with our partners and do our very best to take that to the policymakers, the decision makers and create an even better environment and world for everybody living with immunodeficiency. So at that note, I'm going to draw this to a close. Again, thank you, speakers. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience that I'm sure we will repeat very soon. So thank you, everyone, and good night.